think you you probably crack on with that, Mitesh. Yeah. Okay. Let me just move that out of the way. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction, Matthew, um, and thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I was, what I wanted to talk about today was, you know, I, I knew I was following Elma, and I know Elma very well, so um, I knew hers would be sort of very technical in terms of giving you hints and tips as to the reversible building potential, etc. Um, so I, I've, I've focused on the business model side of things, and, and especially from my experience at BAM, um, having worked in the Netherlands um, with Elma and others on Bambi, uh, but also working on live projects, um, being exposed to a few. So really, I want to touch on um, drivers for change or challenges, and then talk about a couple of case study examples from my experience at BAM. Um, both in the UK and also the Netherlands, um, but then also some examples of you know, different value-based procurement methods that we've used, um, and that in itself gets you to a different outcome. And then at the end, just a, a couple of post-its um, showing uh, opportunities, business models, etc. So just moving on. Let me just, yeah. So this is a quote uh, from Sir Nicholas Stern. I'm not going to read it out for you, um, but as an economist, Sir Nicholas Stern, um, he quite rightly linked our linear consumption patterns with market failure. And that's measured as what we'd say is financial wealth. Um, and also as highlighted a few weeks ago by the Gusgupta review, which some of you might have seen, um, we need to fix this disconnect between GDP or financial wealth um, and natural capital. And that doesn't just go for natural capital, it's sort of human capital, social capital, et cetera. Um, and, and having that understanding or the broader understanding of you know, how we shift from you know, having a very short term mindset to looking at long term value. Um, and if you do something on this side, you know, let's say you increase the biodiversity on a site or you design for deconstruction, um, how does that affect social capital, human capital, or how does it affect your financial capital um, over the life cycle of a project? And that's really where my focus is, is, is sort of understanding and helping clients to, to understand that value, um, but also where they can see an opportunity or how to identify that opportunity going forward. Um, so I've, I've selected a few of the projects that I've been exposed to at BAM to highlight that point around value um, and how we can turn that into a competitive advantage, essentially. And, and also, you know, whilst I agree with um, Elmer's presentation, you know, and you do need to start with design, um, circular economy is broader than just design. It's not just about designing something. Um, it all, also requires a lot of collaboration, systems thinking, and opens the door to, as I've said before, new business models. Okay, so in terms of challenges, and, and again, these are not exhaustive, um, but you know, uh, I, I suppose one of the issues that we deal with, or we need to deal with, is the lack of briefing and the lack of you know outcome. Um, for example, if we look at short term, sorry, that was the delivery. Um, so if we take short term view, is the asset required? Is it flexible? Have we thought about end of life? Um, utilization, so, so have some forethought as to meanwhile uses or land use and value of land. How can we utilize the land to benefit society? Um, maybe think about provision of land or air, water, biodiversity, resources, and climate. And then depletion of natural resources. So taking a whole life carbon approach in the broader sense means to strive for a balance between emissions and production. So if you look at the energy hierarchy, you know, there's also a waste hierarchy. Um, you know, how, how can we work through that and incentivize, um, you know, reuse, repurposing, etc before recycling and then ultimately, you know, sending something to landfill. And again, as Elmer pointed out, um, waste is a mistake. You know, you know, waste is material in the wrong place. 
So circular economy opportunity to, well, the circular economy opportunity to reuse materials um, is to identify new products and services, um, is to look at the sharing economy or performance economy, um, and also just to shake up the way we do business now, you know, because it's not going to change just by, you know, designing in a different way if we have the same contracts, the same level of incentivization through, you know, tender, procurement, etc. Okay, so <clears throat> a couple of examples or case studies, let's say, uh, from my time at BAM. Um, so Circle in Amsterdam, by it was a building for ABN AMRO, uh, the bank, and they basically wanted to invest in um, sustainable investment. You know, so they had, uh, I think, two, 2 million euros that they had to invest by 2020 or something. Um, but to do so, they needed the evidence base and, and they wanted to demonstrate what circularity was. So we went on this journey with them, um, with an existing um, architect. And, and the design at the time was all concrete. It was pretty much a concrete box. You know, and whilst it looked really elegant, it wasn't designed around life cycle thinking. It wasn't designed to be reused. Um, so we did look at reuse, take back, performance contracts, et cetera. And we tried not to make it a fully circular building in, in one sense or the other. It was just a case of testing different theories. Um, so we got involved quite early. And you know, we, yeah, together with the supply chain, uh, getting others involved quite early on, whether they were BAM's original supply chain or more likely you know, suppliers that we hadn't worked with before. Um, and we really focused on you know, how to get the best value in a project. So we put together a, a procurement evaluation matrix, basically a spreadsheet. So it's not as sophisticated as Elmer's approach, um, but um, it worked. And, and it was really just around having that transparency between all the different players around the table um, and actually looking at, we looked at 25 year life cycle model. And it's not to say that after 25 years, the building was gonna be demolished, um, but it was just to say after 25 years, um, what would happen you know, if, if we wanted to uh, dismantle some of the building materials or create new contracts, performance contracts, et cetera, how would that happen? And that led us down the path of the materials that you can see there, which were very much around glue lamp beams, CLT, uh, facades which were clipped in, in place. Uh, we tried not to glue, I don't think we glued anything really. You know, everything was surface fixed. Um, and it was really around the design thinking, you know, the exercise that we had to go through as you do with, you know, looking at air tightness, fireproofing, et cetera. This was about how to design with disassembly in mind. Um, and also we, we published a report through the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, called um, Circular Economy Business Models in the Built Environment. And that was to basically demonstrate that um, if, if you take the, you know, a, linear, um, a linear model and convert that to a circular model, how does that change uh, the incentivization or the, the, the benefits to the designer, the supplier, the asset owner, user, et cetera. So that was quite you know, a, a good you know, case study really in terms of just identifying the value proposition, not just for the end user, but for the other, you know, un understanding what the designer needs to do to change, to, to sort of shift you know, from thinking about things in a linear way to a circular. Um, another project was uh, the circular building, which we constructed in London. And that was just outside the building center in 2017 for the London Design Festival. So we did that with Arup, uh, the Built Environment Trust, uh, and Fenner and Reifer and BAM. Um, and basically we focused on design for reassembly. So again, just as you know, with Elmer's presentation, we were not focused on design for disassembly. We were focused on how do we design something um, and let's say the waterproofing um, fatra waterproofing we, we had various design workshops with them to ensure that we could design it using their products as well as all the cradle to cradle products that we used elsewhere um, disassemble that 
those elements and then be able to reuse them again in a different situation. So that was quite eye-opening, um, just as a process, because there was a lot of, um, you know, workshops and, you know, just thinking through, not just how do we put the, put this together, and we're not tr we're not trying to glue it all together, but you know, we want to design it so that it can be used again. Um, and it did need that commitment from the whole team to understand the business models for them. So some of the discussions were around. Um, getting them to understand the remanufacturing process if they were to take the material back. And then another project which I think this is the last project that I'll show you. Um, this was a huge property development project that BAM um, are doing now and basically a few years ago they bought the site for 84, 85 million euros. Um, designed by SOM, I believe, uh, the master plan. And basically this was a bid that sort of um, was put forward to the, the sort of Amsterdam city council and 50% of the acquisition of the land was based on quality. And again, that, that sort of just goes to show that the, the change in mindset between you know, the, the UK and the, ways that we, the way that we procure um, for financial gain, let's say, very short term thinking, um, against in the Netherlands, we were, you know, incentivized to put forward a bid that had, you know, was, was very high on quality, very high on life cycle thinking. So we focused on getting as much of the existing land. And at the moment, there's a prison that's, uh, that, that sort of has been there for the last 30 years or so, 40 years, maybe made out of concrete, um, steel bars, etc. cetera, um, which, you know, we're sort of looking at solutions with various providers of uh, concrete, for example, looking, looking at how we can demolish or reuse or take down the concrete panels and then start to reuse them, um, whether it's crushed down and reused as concrete again, as aggregate, or reused in their original form as panels. And then the jail bars, um, some of them will be um, balconies or bridge, you know, um, yeah, balconies around bridges as, as well. So, so again, you know, we were incentivized to put forward all of these proposals, but also to work with our supply chain to make it happen. Um, and then finally, the other example that I wanted to show you was um, the amount of supply chain engagement that we had to do. So as a construction company, um, we had to engage with um, a lot of our supply chain, or we wanted to, to make sure that you know, it, it was not seen as, you know, BAM are doing circular buildings. You can't do that. I mean, literally without, without having your design team, your supply chain, you know, understand the impacts and the consequences of designing in, in a certain way or providing the materials that you need. Um, so we went on various journeys with our supply chain. We had a few different workshops um, and also some success stories. So we, we had, you know, a lighting supplier that we use in the UK. You know, and whilst we've used Philips in the Netherlands, you know, to procure lighting as a service models, um, we worked with Whitecroft uh, Lighting and actually, you know, engaged them to give us a quote for a performance contract. And whilst that took ages to just to sort of get over the line and get them to understand uh, the value proposition to them, uh, we had another opportunity for Cheshire Police Headquarters, which um, we we're managing as an FM contract. Uh, we had to change some lighting. So all of the lighting needed to be replaced. It was originally provided by Whitecroft Lighting, let's say 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and rather than just taking that out as we would normally do and throw it away, um, we basically incentivized Whitecroft to um, work with us to come up with a, a better solution. So actually what we did was we kept the carcass um, and change the motor and the LED, you know, change the um, light fitting to an LED. And, and essentially that was cheaper than getting the new product in the first place. And also encouraged Whitecroft Lighting to start thinking about how they would take those materials back um, and, you know, re, you know, sell that as a, as a product going forward. So that was quite eye opening. And for Whitecroft Lighting, that resulted in them producing a new product. So they have a new product range as a result of that um, engagement with us, which is great. 
And then finally, just looking at procurement models, as I said, you know, whether we worked on both um, building products, projects, but also infrastructure, um, we've got a range of different um, procurement routes that, that sort of incentivized us to deliver a circular outcome. So MV scoring model, um, so the, the dike that you can see there, Afslau um, Dijk is called in, in Dutch. Um, basically, we, we put forward our bid and, you know, because there were, you know, let's say 20% of the bid was um, looking at long-term value, so it was sustainable innovations, um, our, our tender actually went in discounted by that 20%. So um, again, you know, we won the job based on the fact that we were the cheapest over that whole life cycle. Um, we also produced total cost solutions, um, agreed profit share. So, you know, having that open book policy where you can talk, talk around the table with the client um, and actually say, look, you know, yes, we're going to invest our time doing a little bit more R&D, you know, looking at materials that can be reused again. So we used... Uh, a Philips um, headquarters in Eindhoven that was going to be demolished. We used the timber facade, uh, so it was a timber um, glazed, you know, glazed windows. We used them for internal partitions in the ABN Amro pavilion. Um, and also at the pavilion, we, we, we instigated a review on higher residual value of materials. So again, looking at the materials that we would use on day one, um, and making sure that after 25 years that they were actually worth more than, you know, the standard products that you'd normally build with. And then I think I'm out of time, but just to leave you with um, a few opportunities, whether it's looking at digital material platforms, which we've done, um, or looking at different sharing platforms, um, different types of contracting, so performance contracting, uh, translating material waste into value, um, closing the loop, remanufacturing, as I, I touched on before. And essentially, there are, you know, benefits for the whole team. Um, and, it's, and it's really around understanding it. And I think as also, just to reiterate, as Elmer said, it's probably not, it's quite complicated. It's quite complex to look at circular economy, but it's, I'd say it's fun as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nitesh. Um, I think it's really good to sort of just delve into some of the ways that you engage with, with the supply chain and, and the, the clients to, to help realise what value can actually come with these.